This video is not exactly a travel video. To use a less formal term, this video is a little sciencey. I provide a simple explanation of a really cool geological habitat in Yukon, Canada, named the Takini Salt Flats. If you're not interested in the science of the world beneath your feet, that's okay. I think you will still enjoy seeing this remarkable northern salt flat landscape and gain a little insight about the geological influence on this remarkable habitat. While I am not a salt flat expert, I have simplified much of the technical aspects of the geological history. In doing so, I have introduced some inaccuracies that will be quite apparent to geological experts. But let's give it a try. On Google Earth, west of Whitehorse, Yukon, you can see an area with white ground and a single purple rimmed lake. Many smaller round lakes exist in the immediate area. Some of the smaller lakes evolved to become salt rich. That salt is deposited on the ground seasonally, covering the ground with a white salty crust. Those salt flats support some unusual salt tolerant plants and a beautiful purple colored sulfur bacteria. I'm talking about the very cool Takini salt flats, located about 40 kilometers or 25 miles west northwest from Whitehorse, Yukon, Canada. Join me in this episode number 44 of Rambles with Robin and Ruby while I share a little insight about the Takini Salt Flats, its interesting geological history, and some of the life forms that occur there because of that geological history. The Takini Salt Flats occur within the traditional territories of the Kwanwan Dun First Nation and the Champagne and Aishihik First Nation people. Enjoy your tour of this unusual geological feature. The Takini Salt Flat is an unusual geological habitat in Yukon. To get a basic understanding of why Takini Salt Flats exist, let's briefly consider how some of those small lakes in this area formed and how they became salty. Much of the following explanation of the salt flat formation comes from a geological paper published by Jeff Bond, manager of Surficial Geology Yukon Geological Survey. Additional information comes from an interview with Jeff Bond that is reported in the Yukon News by Jackie Hong. The references to those sources are included in the video description. When you look at the area now, you see mountains, the Ibex Valley, Takini River, and several small lakes. To the geologist, the Ibex Valley is much more than that. It was once the bottom of a long, narrow lake named Glacial Lake Champagne. Glacial Lake Champagne formed towards the end of the last ice age when the glacier started to melt, perhaps about 11,000 years ago. Geologists call this type of lake a proglacial lake. A proglacial lake forms when water accumulates at the toe or front of a melting glacier. But you're thinking, glacier? What glacier? There's no glacier here now. Exactly. The glaciers and the valleys melted away about 11,000 years ago. But what was the role of the glaciers? During the peak of the last ice age, about 25,000 years ago, parts of this region were covered by glaciers. Some of those glaciers helped carve out and were contained by the local valleys. The Athabasca Glacier seen here gives you a modern day example of one such glacier that exists as a toe of ice flowing off the Columbia Icefield located in the Canadian Rockies. By the way, 
This view of the Athabasca Glacier is from the Wilcox Pass hiking trail in Jasper National Park, Alberta. But back to Yukon. Towards the end of the Ice Age, the position of the glacial toes changed as the glaciers alternated between growing forward and melting back over time. In the Ibex Valley area, water from the melting glacier created a pro-glacial lake named Glacial Lake Champagne. The aerial extent of Glacial Lake Champagne and other pro-glacial lakes in the area changed as the glaciers continued to melt at the end of the Ice Age. Great volumes of sand, silt and clay were deposited into the bottom of Glacial Lake Champagne. The lake changed shape to fill the valley as the glacial toe melted back. Eventually, when the valley glaciers melted, the lake water from Glacial Lake Champlain began to drain away from what we now call the Ibex Valley. At the time Glacial Lake Champlain began to drain away, large massive permafrost ice bodies formed or already existed beneath the land surface. But over time, as the climate warmed, some of the large permafrost ice bodies began to melt. The melting created a depression in the land surface. Surface water also began to collect into the depressions to form a lake or smaller pond. Geologists call these thermokarst ponds. Many lakes in the Ibex Valley, including lakes in the Takini Salt Flats, are thermokarst lakes. So, we have a shallow understanding of the geological recent history of the Ibex Valley and how the lakes in the Takini Salt Flat area formed. So we can see that the Takini Salt Flats had an unusual geological history. As I will explain shortly, the salt flat is composed of sodium sulfate salts, which supports some very different plants and a spectacular purple colored sulfur bacteria. In a future video, we will look at that purple colored sulfur bacteria as well as some of the plants that thrive on the salt flats. But in this video, I will continue to set the context for the Takini salt flats by briefly considering how the salt formed. We just learned that many of the lakes in this part of the Ibex Valley formed as shallow thermokarst lakes. We also learned that the Ibex Valley is filled with sediments that were deposited on the bottom of the pro-glacial lake named Glacial Lake Champagne. Three important steps are required to transform a freshwater lake into a salty lake. We have to first collect salt from the sediments in the valley. Secondly, we have to pond the salt carrying water in thermokarst lakes. And thirdly, we have to concentrate the salt through evaporation. The following cartoons give you an illustration of how this process of concentrating salt takes place. First, chemical reactions between the groundwater and the sediment remove some of the salt components from minerals in the sediment. During step two, the tiny amount of dissolved salt extracted from the sediment is carried off by the water to fill a depression in the land to form a shallow thermal karst lake. It's important that the water does not drain away from the lake. During the third salt concentrating step, the local climate of the area comes into play. Because this area enjoys a dry, warm summer climate, the thermokarst lake water evaporates during the summer. As the water evaporates, the salt becomes more and more concentrated in the leftover water to the point where the salt precipitates out as a white salt on the bottom and as an apron around the lake during the summer. If the lake completely or nearly evaporates, a white colored salt flat forms on the land. Come fall and winter, the shallow dry lakes become filled again by rain and blanketed by snow. The next spring, the snow melts, the lakes refill, the weather warms, and the evaporation cycle needed to produce the salt flat begins again. So evaporation is a key step needed to concentrate the dissolved salt as a solid to form the Takini Salt Flat. Now that we have an understanding of how the Takini Salt Flat formed, you might ask, is the salt on those flats the same as table salt we use to season food? Well, we are familiar with table salt, 
but table salt is not the only salt that forms in nature. Chemists use the term salt to describe a wide range of compounds having specific chemical properties. The salts on the Tikini salt flats consist of two minerals, myrabolite and thenardite. Both these salts are made up of the elements sodium, sulfur, oxygen, and sometimes a little water, and they exist in the form of what geologists call a sulfate. So no, there is no table salt on the Tikini salt flats. So this ends our tour of the Tikini salt flats. I hope this brief introduction leaves you with a bit of wonder about the geological processes that shaped the earth, created lakes, and formed a different habitat that supports unusual life. In the next video, I will describe some of the plant life and other unusual life forms that live on the Tikini salt flats in Yukon, Canada.